Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We are told that in the scriptures that there be signs pointing toward the return of the Lord. I believe that we see those signs in the world today. I believe that the coming of the Lord is near. And that's a quote from Billy Graham. As I was studying this and began to look at this, and we want to welcome those who are listening by Facebook. God bless you. Sometimes it just amazes me. I see how many times people are listening in all over the world to our little broadcast and our little building and our little city of New Bedford. And uh, thank God, amen, that we can broadcast video, live stream. And thank God for all of you for your support in sharing the gospel around the world. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to working in India and in Pakistan and Guatemala. And we love to see a church start in Portugal. That would be awesome. Uh, we never know what God's going to do. And we just keep rolling with whatever God says for us to continue to do. He said to occupy until I come. Can I get an amen somewhere? He said occupy. That means to do something. Just don't sit there. Do something. Amen. So I have six questions that we will be addressing this morning, and I'm sure that there will be many more, but I believe that these should be sufficient in examining this subject matter that we're talking about, the times of the end. I'll give them to you now and so that you can write them down, or maybe if you want to get the video uh, that's available on our website, or get the audio version, you can also download that. The six questions that we're going to ask this morning is, what is the spiritual end or secular climate going to be like? How can we know that we are truly living in the last days? How can we truly know that the time of the end is upon us? How do we know that? What is the spiritual and the secular climate? When have the times of the end begun to be evident? We'll be asking that also. The third question is, is it prophetic? Can this be altered in any way, and can we stop it as Christians simply by prayer and fasting? The fourth question is, why must it happen? Why must it happen? The fifth question is, where or what region or nation will it begin? Everyone wants to know. They they. Uh, wondering, is it going to be the United States or is it going to be somewhere else? And what is the time frame of this event? So we're going to be touching on all of these things. But in answering the first question about what, we will be, what will be the climate like, we must look to only the one source. We can't look to the news. There's a lot of fake news out there. We can't look to the Internet. Because we have a lot of wackos out there okay, proclaiming all kinds of things. So the only one true source that you and I can look to for the end times, and I was talking with somebody the other day, and they said, you know, I, I, I wonder what the end times are going to be like. I want, you know, the world's getting worse and worse, and this is a, really a non-believer. He's saying the world's getting worse and worse, and how can we know what's ahead of us? I said, all you've got to do is read Revelation. See, I believe that Revelation is not just a storybook. I believe that the book of Revelation is, a, is an apocalyptic scene that God has allowed to be written for you and I to know the last days. And to not know everything about it, but to know the very factual things that he wanted us to know about it so that we can get ready for his rapturing of the church before his second coming. Amen? Now, I may be talking here to some that believe in they're going to go through the tribulation, and if you believe that, God bless you. If you want your head cut off, that's wonderful. But I believe that the Bible 
is very emphatic and clear that I'm going before the tribulation period starts. Hallelujah. And you say, well, how come you believe that? Because the Bible says that God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, remember, Paul is talking to the Thessalonians who are believers. So he's not talking about salvation, of being saved from your sins. He's talking about you be, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to, be, but to be saved from that wrath. He's not appointed us to wrath. So first we will answer the spiritual climate. How do we really know what the spiritual climate's going to be like during the last days? Well, let's turn first and foremost to 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting with verse 1. Can we do that this morning? This is going to be more of a teaching than it's going to be a preaching. Now, I can do preaching if you want to. I can go and talk about the walls of Jericho falling down, getting all excited, and hallelujah, shouting and jumping. That's okay once in a while. But I believe that the only thing that's going to keep you, the only thing that's going to sustain you, the only thing that's going to give you the strength to keep going on during the times of the end before the rapture, because how many know that we will be persecuted before the rapture? See, that's where a lot of people get mistaken. They mistake the wrath of God for persecution. That's not persecution. We're going to be persecuted. Jesus said, if you want to live godly in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted. People will laugh at you. People will make fun of you. They'll mock you. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says this. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. In other words, he's making a definite, definite statement here of something that's going to happen. It was already beginning in his time. Understand that. Paul is talking to Pastor Timothy who is the pastor of the Ephesus church. And you know, we talked about that. The Ephesus church was an idolatry, a city of idolatry. We talked about how that where sin abounds, God's grace abounds even more. And he's telling Timothy under the unction of the Holy Spirit, he's saying, listen to me. The Spirit is ex speaketh expressly that in the latter times, in the last days, in the time of the last times of times, that generation that's living in this particular time, the last times, concerning the church, say concerning the church, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I want you for one moment to concentrate, if you will, with me, please. To know that there is a departing, there is a leaving from something that's been given. Something that's been solid in their life, something that's been... A, a stapler in their life, there's been a departing from that. Always remember, the problem is never truth. The problem is error. Some people say, well, truth uh, divides and doctrine divides. No, it does not. Truth stays true. It's the error that veers off and causes error. Truth still remains. Some shall depart from the faith. We heard, uh, I believe it was uh, Pastor Layton when he came, and he gave the statistic that in three years, 27,000 or uh, 24,000 churches had closed in America. That's a lot of churches. Some new ones have opened, but not at the same rate. Many people today that come and get saved, especially young people, when they go away to college and they're filled with the philosophies and ideologies of the professors, end up backsliding, end up turning their hearts from God that once was on fire for God, once loved God, all of a sudden now, 
their heart has become cold and they're more like the world than they are like Christ-like. Because that philosophy, that ideology is not man-made. It's satanically induced. It's a seducing spirit. There's a group called the Bana Study. And 38% are sympathetic right now to some Muslim teachings. 61% agree with ideas rooted in new spirituality. That's called the New Age. 54% resonate with postmodernist views. What's the postmodernist views? There's a, there's a movement, if you will, that's out there called the Emergent Church. Don't know if you ever heard about it. The Emergent Church comes and says that the Bible is not really truth. Truth is found in the reality of the postmodern mind. And so their churches no longer have crosses, they no longer have pulpits. They no longer have choirs. They, never, they no longer have a lot of Christian music. And all they have is motivational speakers. Just turn your television set on. You can find a few. 36% accept the ideas associated with Marxism. 29% believe ideas based on secularism. There's a great falling away from the church, from Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 says this. Very important in conjunction with the scripture. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. How is that seduction going to take place? The devil's not going to come and stand before you to seduce you. He says, let no man deceive you by any means. One of the greatest weapons that Satan has is man. Men throughout the ages have tried to deceive from the very beginning. He says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day the coming of the Lord shall not come except it come a falling away first. Think for a moment when you first became a Christian. Think for a moment when you, the first time you accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the excitement that you had, the faith that you had. You wanted to be in church. You wanted to be at every service. Now, I can talk from years of experience and and I can tell you that Sister Debbie could be a witness to this. We used to have church four or five times a week. We'd have youth, and then we'd have Bible study, and we'd have Friday night fellowship. We'd have a Saturday night fellowship, and Sunday morning we'd find a place to go and worship, and Sunday night we'd be in church. We were in church all the time. We wanted to be in church, and there was a move of God among the youth. And the youth were laying hands on each other and getting filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. The youth were doing it. We had meetings where the youth would come in from high school with, with all kinds of you know, peer pressure and problems, and they would fall on their knees at the altar, and the young people would go up, not the pastor. The young people would go up and encourage them and put their arm around them and pray for them and lift them up and they would get saved and they would get filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what we need today. Now all kids are concerned about is scooter boards. Whatever you call them dumb things. What do they call them? Power boards? Hover boards. We called them scooter boards when I was young. Basketball, sports, 
Nothing wrong with those things, but we've replaced the things that we really, really need to teach them how to depend on God, to, to pray and to seek God and to enjoy the presence of the Lord and the gifts of the Spirit and see God move and filled with the Spirit of God. We need that back in our churches. Everyone's concerned about their own life, their own plans, their own goals. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Now, can I tell you this? I'm going to prove to you with these scriptures, I'm going to prove to you we are in the last days. A lot of times we say we believe we're in the last days. But when I come out with, when you, when you see this, you're going you're gonna to go, wow. Remember he said, let no man deceive you, right? Keep that in the back of your mind. Let no man deceive you. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says this. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Now hear me now. Loving money is not the root of all evil. Uh, I mean, money is not the root, of, the root of all evil. It's loving it. Loving money is the root of all evil, not money. Everybody knows we need money, right? I need money for my honey. You need money. So money's not bad. It's the love of the money. It's the undivided attention that people give to money. Today, people put money ahead of God. Sometimes people rob God. Did you know you can rob God? You know you can be called a thief, a robber, who stole from God. You say, how can I steal from God? By your tithes and offerings. Some people say, you know what? I don't believe in tithing. That's okay, you thief. My Bible says no, no thief will enter the kingdom of heaven. Keep on stealing. Come on. He said, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred. Everyone say erred. Say it again, erred. Say it again, erred. I just like hearing you say it. From the faith. And what happens? They pierce themselves through with what? Many sorrows. We read before, let no man deceive you. Right? And we see here that the love of money is the root of all evil, while some covered it after, they have what? Aired. Do you know what that word aired in the Greek means? The word air in the Greek means be seduced. What does it mean? Seduce. It means to attract someone to a belief or into a course of action that is inadvisable or foolish to, pers to persuade to disobedience or disloyalty, to lead astray usually by persuasion of false promises. The word erred means what? Be seduced. Now, 1 Timothy 4.1 says that the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some shall what? Depart from the faith, giving heed to what? Seducing spirits. Turn your television on, and you have people promising you a hundredfold blessing if you send them your money. Are you hearing me? People are being seduced to send their money to these prosperity deceivers
so that you can plant your seed and receive a hundredfold blessing. You know what I said to the Lord one time? This is a true story. When I give money away, you know what I tell the Lord? I say, Lord, don't return the money back to me. Give me more souls. I would rather have souls. If I give $100 to missions, I would rather see 10 or 50 souls come to saving knowledge of Jesus than me getting $100 back. People get excited. Oh, pastor, I gave $10 and I got $100 back. Praise God. I would rather have 100 souls. Why? Because we said, don't lay up treasures on, on earth. Lay up your treasures in heaven. So how I know we're in the last days is you can turn your television on and you can see the prophetic fulfillment of this scripture. Men are being seduced. They're erring from the faith because of the love of money. Pastors, ministry leaders are erring from the faith because they've given themselves over to money because that's all you ever hear about is money, 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 money on television. And you wonder why some people don't want to be associated with Christianity. I've heard some people when I've talked to them say, oh, you, are you like those crooks on television? All they ever talk about is money. They first started out talking about Jesus and being saved and being born again and getting right with God and, and confessing your sins and asking God to forgive you and repentance. When's the last time you heard that kind of a message on television? If Christians today would take their, the extra resources of money instead of trying to sow it into some seed somewhere and take their money and have a television program station called the Evangelical Network where they could preach the gospel simply 24-7 every single day. Just the gospel. About repentance. About obedience. About holiness. About righteousness. About justification and sanctification. And preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not the gospel of mammon. Not the gospel of money. But preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just today I've shown you from... And when you go home, turn your television on. Put your Christian uh, television on and see what I'm talking about. False prophets saying, I, I, I sense the Lord is telling me that there's a thousand people out there to give a thousand dollars. It's a marketing concept. You don't need a, you don't need a, a lot of money to do a lot of things for God. The Lord gave me a strategy. How we could build a church and buy that land debt free. No bank. Pay cash. And that doesn't mean that I have to have you make cakes and pies and sell them on the street and sell your clothes. And it's a very simple solution. You want to know what it is, don't you? I can tell by your face. I'm not going to tell you. No, I'll tell you. I said, Lord, you want us to build over there? You want us to build? How can I build it without going into debt? And this is what he told me. How much will it cost? I did my research, building materials, price of the land, price of, for doing the parking lot, the whole thing. I did the whole thing. Everything done, the, and you have to understand that I like things done in the spirit of excellence. 
I'm not talking $10 million. But I said, Lord, we could have an outreach center. We could teach English, have teachers come in, Christian teachers come in and teach English to the people that are here that are foreigners and they need to, they need to learn how to speak English. For three and a half million dollars. Now we're not going to do campaigns. Nothing like that. So the Lord said to me, how hard would it be if three and a half million people gave one dollar each? Right? Now if I asked you all for a dollar, you'd give me one, wouldn't you? To build a, a building next door, you'd give me a dollar. Right? Let's say three million. Make it easy. If I came to you and said, give me two dollars, most of you could afford two dollars, right? That's only 1.5 million. If I asked for four dollars, that wouldn't break anybody. That's about 750,000 people. Three hundred seventy-five thousand would be eight eight dollars a piece. You follow what I'm getting? It can happen. I just haven't had the venue or the platform for it. But if God wants us to have that building, God wants us to have that land. Somehow He's going to open the door for that platform for me. You just think there's three million Christians all over the world. All I need is a dollar. We could build a brand new sanctuary, a new learning center. Amen. Daycare. Amen. Hire people for daycare. Police officers and firefighters, EMTs, we get a half, half price discount. If you come to the church and you tithe on a regular basis, your child goes for free. Hello? Come on, it's possible. Uh-oh. Pastor Tom has given us a dollar. Let this be the first one among many. Praise the Lord. Now, I didn't ask him to do this, you know. So I'll, I'll, where's the bucket? Okay, that's okay. I'll, I'll put it over here. Let that be the first one, Lord. Hallelujah. Now let's examine for a moment now that we looked at the spiritual aspect of what's going on. Let's look at the natural aspect, the secular. Turn with me, please, to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verses 3 to 7. Everybody got that? Matthew 24, starting with verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, what shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Two aspects. What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Right? Two things. Inquiring minds like to know. Verse 4. The very first thing he says to them is what? 
Ah, here we go again. So we understand that the, one of the greatest weapons that the enemy is going to use is deception, and he's going to use men to deceive. Take heed, take notice, be aware that no man deceive you. Verse 5. For many, say many, shall come in my authority or my name, saying what? I am Christ. Have you heard of anyone saying they're Christ? Huh? I did some research. Every single one of these in the different centuries have said that they are Jesus Christ in the flesh. All the way through to the 20th to the 21st century, all these people have said that they are Christ and had thousands and thousands of followers. Let me give you just a couple of our day. David Koresh, remember him? Where is... Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda. He was, let's see. 19, he was born in 1946. Oh, he died in 2013, so um, I guess he's not Jesus. He's a Puerto Rican founder and leader of an organization of Growing in Grace based in Miami, Florida, who claimed that the resurrected, resurrected Christ integrated himself within me. He was, the, he was now the, the fulfillment of the second coming. Last I checked, he had over 2 million followers. Has churches all through the United States, Florida, All of these people claiming that they are Jesus Christ. In the last days, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now think about this. There are millions and millions of people who believe these people and are now dead in hell. Because they believed in the false Jesus, false Christ. Next verse, please. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. We are. There shall be wars and rumors of wars. Here is a list. I'm not going to read them all because we'll be here all day. And I'm still going to try to get them. These are all lists of world wars that have happened through the centuries. Hundreds of millions, are you hearing me? Hundreds of millions of people have died in these wars. There are several wars going on right now in, in, our, in our world, some of us we don't even know about. Millions and millions of people. He says, see that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not quite yet. Next verse. For nation shall rise against nation. We see that even in today. Kingdom against kingdom. Look at Europe. Look at, look at the United Kingdom. Look at Paris. There shall be famines. I did have a list here of all the famines that took place throughout the world. Hundreds of them. There should be pestilence. I just got three here. I took pestilence is a contagious disease that spreads out of control, killing many people, 
And here are some of the examples of the worst epidemics around the world. AIDS is worldwide. Begin late 70s to the present times. Is the immune deficiency syndrome is a disease that destroys the body's immune system and the ability to fight sickness. This virus has developed as long as 50 to 150 years ago, but it wasn't identified until 1981. The United Nations and the World Health Organization reported a, a total of 25 million people have died from AIDS as of December 2006. 25 million. The Black Death in Western Europe in 1347 to 51. This plague thought to be the bubonic plague spread throughout Europe, killing about half the continent's population. It was called the Black Death because of the black blotches that appears on the victim's bodies. The plague was carried by infected fleas or black rats. And then influenza, 1918 to 1919, it was worldwide. These are, all, these are worldwide, except for the one in Western Europe. The flu was highly contagious that killed 20 million throughout the world. Without effective medication to treat the illness, most people died of complications from the disease, like pneumonia. Have you noticed that pneumonia has been on the rise lately? <clears throat> people having breathing deficiencies? This pestilence, along with the Black Death, resulted in the highest number of deaths worldwide in history. There shall be what? Yeah, you can put that slide up for me. You probably can't see this. But if you want to look, you'll see here that in the 1860s, there was a famine where almost 5 million people died. 1870s, almost 21 million died. And all the way through the 1890s, almost 18 million. The 1920s, another 15, 16 million. I'm going to give you the big ones. 1940, 9 million. 1950s, which is not too long ago, uh, 14 million. The 1960s, worldwide, there was almost 17 million. And the 1990s, which isn't too long ago, about 2.5 to 3 million. Famines, pestilences, all in the plural, by the way. Earthquakes. As of May 9, 2017, that was not too far, a couple of weeks ago, within the last 24 hours of that time, 45 earthquakes of magnitude 2.5 or greater have struck Alaska, and 25 of them were of the magnitude 4.0 or greater. The worst one had a magnitude of 6.2. Earthquakes shall increase. But none of the earthquakes did much damage because most of them was, didn't hit a, popula a populated area. But the reason why all is shaking is because there's much concern, listen to this, because of the ring of fire, they call it, runs right along the southern Alaska coastline, and all of the earthquakes, except for the one, were all along the southern coast. After running along the southern Alaskan coast, the ring of fire goes south along the west coast of Canada, the United States, and Mexico. What affects one part of the fault network will often trigger something along other portions of the same fault network. And so many living on the west coast, and may, many of you may like this, many of you don't like this, I don't know. Some of you don't think this is boring, but I'm telling you, these are things that you can look out for and find, hey, we're living in the last days. For a long time, scientists have acknowledged, and I saw a report by Shepard Smith on Fox News, this was a few years ago, about two years ago, three years ago, I believe it was, and he gave the same statistics that I'm giving you here. Is there's a acknowledged that a major Cascadia subduction zone earthquake is way overdue. 
And when one finally strikes, the devastation that we could see in this specific northwest is likely to be off the charts. In fact, some scientists believe that the coming Cascadia sub subduction zone earthquake could potentially be as high as magnitude 9.0. What was the uh, earthquake measurement in Haiti? Seven? Did it do a lot of damage? Here's the thing about this earthquake on the Cascadia subzone. They said it's not, it's, it, even though it's going to be high, 9.0, as high as 9.0, it's the duration. It's supposed to last three to five minutes. That 9.0 magnitude quake could trigger a 500 mile per hour wave and put 70,000 people in the inundation zone. A 500 mile an hour wave. That wave is approximately anywhere from 75 to 150 feet high. Now you saw the tsunami wave that came into Japan. Right? A few years ago. Almost destroyed their nuclear reactor. You saw that water just come right over everything. Swipe everything away. Why am I telling you all this? Biological territory. Biological weapons. Do you know that right now for about... Oh, let's see. How much did they say? For about ten to twenty thousand dollars, someone could obtain the anthrax spores. And a mere eight grams would infect heavy casualties in one square mile area. Let me just show, share with this with you. What does that got to do? I'm trying to show you secular information that is backing up spiritual information. Last July, you want to talk about a falling away, right? Last July, for the first time, a mass in Italy, Catholic mass, a verse of the Quran was recited from the altar. A priest in south of Italy enraged parishioners by dressing the Virgin Mary in a Muslim baruch for his church's Christmas nativity scene. These interfaith interactivities are based on gradual elimination of the Western Christian heritage in favor of Islam. The Catholic, the Catholic clergy is probably disoriented by Pope Francis himself. He was the first to allow the reading of Islamic prayers and Quran readings from the Vatican. So I'll leave that there. Christian clergy helped a Muslim mosque open in a Pentecostal church. Where are we? Okay, second question. I'll have to go through these really quick. When have the times of the end begun to be evident? Start in the days of Noah. Why did God destroy the earth? Why did God say to Noah, you, you and your family, only eight of you found favor in my sight? Only eight. So I'm going to destroy the entire world. Why? What was the one predominant thing that was going on in the earth? Huh? Lawlessness? Listen to this. Read it. It's in Genesis. It's in Genesis. Uh, what did I write that down? One second, I'll tell you. Genesis chapter 6, verse 12. As fast as they can get that scripture up, I can get done. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was what? For all flesh had corrupt his way upon the earth. Next verse. 
Did I, did I give you the right one? Yeah. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with what? What are you seeing today? Didn't Jesus say, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be? Is it true? As it was in the days of Noah, violence. What else? He also said, as it was in the days of Lot. What was going on in the days of Lot? Sodom and Gomorrah, homosexuality. What do we have today? Do you see that we're living in the last days? It is vitally important that you get this point. That we're living in the last days. Don't take chances. Don't live like the world. Don't look like the world. Don't sound like the world. Is it prophetic? Can this be altered in any way and can we stop it? Absolutely not. We can't stop it. You can fast and pray and try to change God's mind, but guess what? There's a prophetic calendar and a prophetic decree by God that you cannot change. Why must it happen? Because man has to come to the end of himself and see that there's no other hope other than God. No other hope than Jesus coming back and straightening out the mess that we've made. The fifth question, where or what region of the nation will it begin? A lot of the commentaries that I've read on this issue is either two places, Syria or Turkey. Syria. What's going on in Syria? Confusion. Who's the author of confusion? Not God. And what is the time frame of this event? It's imminent. Imminent means at any time. I have so much more, but I've ran out of time, and I, I, I can't justify keeping you here. Maybe on a Bible study we can get a little bit more into it. But do you understand that we're living in the last days? That the seduction that's taking place is money? Because one of the signs that, of showing that Jesus is coming is that people, men will seduce you. They, they have erred from the faith. They have erred from the faith because of the love of money. And we see that on television. And I tell you that television is one of the greatest evidences of living in the last days. The teachers are having itching ears. In other words, what they're doing is they're preaching what people want to hear rather than what they need. You need the truth. You need the gospel. You need the word of God. But now we have mega churches that are motivational speakers to motivate you to a better life. Your best life now? Really? Is this your best life? I thought eternal life was the better life. I mean, this life, we got sorrow, pain, persecution, all kinds of problems, bills. I mean, you know, we, we got a lot of things going on on this earth. This ain't my best life now. My best life's coming because I got a mansion. I'm going to walk on streets of gold. I'm going to be in the presence of God 24-7. What could be greater than that? I don't want a greater life now. I don't know about you. I know what kind of life I do want. The Bible says, whatever state you find yourself in, there would be content. Because contentment with godliness is great gain. Amen? Let's all stand. Thank you for listening to me. I know this wasn't a very moving word today, but it was filled with information. The Bible says some, sometimes admonition, rebuke, sometimes edification.
but it's to let you know that we are in the last days. Don't let no man deceive you. I know they said, where is the promise of his coming? They've been saying that from the beginning. Oh, we've been saying that for years. Don't let no man deceive you. He's coming. He's coming soon. Pastor Robert Layton had a vision of going to heaven. He died. He was dead for eight minutes. He gave his testimony here. In those eight minutes, he said he walked with Jesus. Jesus said, I'm sending you back for one purpose and one purpose only is to tell my church I'm coming back very soon. Do you believe it this morning? If you're saying yes, you believe what I'm telling you, then you'll start to live differently. You'll forsake sin. Thank you, I got one amen. You'll forsake sin. You'll, you'll seek after holiness and righteousness and purity. Come on. You don't want to do anything to displease your Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you. We praise you. Lord, I pray those listening by Facebook, God, that you will draw them to you, not to me or this ministry, but draw them to, the, to you, Lord. But if they repent of their sins and ask you into their life to be the Lord and master of their life and believe that your Father raised you from the dead, Lord Jesus, they will be saved. I pray that men will repent everywhere and believe the gospel. Repent and be baptized. I pray that people in the church will be invigorated, Lord, with truth. That, Lord, they will, by your Holy Spirit, consecrate themselves and get themselves ready for the greatest event that's ever going to take place. The second coming of Jesus. The rapture of the church. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Father, I pray your blessing upon them. Be with them as they go their separate ways. I pray, God, a blessing upon them. Keep them safe. Keep them healthy. Provide for their need. And we give you the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. All God's people say, amen. God bless you.